King, you may remain seated for the time being. Uh, Mr. Jarvis, uh, Mr. Zahir, it will be very clear that I'm reading from some tight sentencing notes. Copies will be made available at the conclusion. Uh, Matthew King, on the 20th of January this year, you pleaded guilty to an offence alleging the preparation of terrorism acts, and I must now sentence you. The span of conduct covered by the indictment is a six-month period between the 22nd of December 2021 and the 17th of May 2022. In that time, you accept you engaged in conduct in preparation for giving effect to your intention, either commit acts of terrorism yourself or to assist another to commit acts of terrorism. By your guilty plea, you accept that you actively desire to travel from the UK to an area of Syria controlled by ISIS to participate in ISIS activities. That would have involved you using serious violence yourself or endangering the lives of others. Also by the plea, you accept an intention to commit an act of serious violence against the person or endangering the life of a person here in the UK, specifically either a member of the armed forces or a police officer. In the written base of plea, it is said that you have only carried out a terrorist activity here if your plans to travel to Syria and to join ISIS were frustrated. The prosecution does not accept that part of the base of plea. Both the prosecution and the defence agree that this aspect of the base of plea does not make any difference to sentence in this case, as on any view you accept you had an intention to commit both terrorist acts and that you made preparations towards the commission of both types of terrorist act. From what has emerged from the police investigation, it is clear that you are someone who developed an, in, an entrenched Islamist extremist mindset, extreme anti-Western views, and that you intended to commit terrorist acts both in UK and overseas. At secondary school, you are someone who dabbled in drugs and where your behavior became more aggressive. You were expelled from school and attended an educational unit in Basildon. Your behaviour deteriorated, and it was noted that you'd often return home stoned and argue with your mother. You moved to other educational units, finally leaving education aged 16 without any qualifications. In 2020, in a conversation between you and your mother, you spoke about finding faith. As you said you would like to visit a mosque, your mother took you to a mosque in Chelmsford. You also watched videos about Islam on YouTube. This appeared at first to have a positive impact on you. Over time, you started to wear more traditional Islamic clothing. You ordered Islamic books and a prayer mat. You were eating only halal food and were learning Arabic. By May 2021, you were attending the Bin Baz Mosque in Stratford. Your family noted your behavior had become more extreme. They noted you were having conversations online with a girl. You told your mother she was a doctor or a trainee doctor. You also said you wanted to go to Syria with her in order to help people. Some videos you showed your mother were of a concern to her. They showed motivational chanting, people engaged in heat debate at Speaker's Corner. When your mother commented about these having a negative influence on you, you denied it. You became a member of two local community online groups using the name of Madi Adulabdi. One group, the South End Brothers, had 25 to 30 members, and the other, South End Shura, six members. Your mother was concerned at some of the online material you were viewing, as to her it was promoting hatred. When challenged, you denied it, claimed you were watching videos to inform yourself about the history of Islam. You also said you did not believe in terrorism. Your mother, very correctly, made contact with PREVENT. In December 2021, you registered as a customer for the Knife Warehouse. Although you signed up for their regular newsletters, you did not place any orders. However, soon afterwards, in January 2022, you carried out searches on the internet for ISIS Knife Tactical Training and ISIS Knife practical training video. I note that the last login to the Knife Warehouse site was on the 3rd of January 2022. In March 2022, 
you made notes on your phone about detonating homemade bombs. Later in March 2022, you recorded a video at Stratford train station on your mobile. The video shows the back of a uniformed police officer. In other videos, you appear to be noting the location of CCTV cameras. Two days later, you bought a pair of combat specs, ops glasses, military-style glasses, and military-style combat gloves. In April 2022, you used your phone to record yourself walking near the barracks of the 7th Rifles Regiment with a Nasheed promoting violent rhetoric overlaid in the recording. The rhetoric speaks of killing with rage and hate. In April 2022, you made a derogatory comment about Imran Khan, the former Pakistani Prime Minister. Your comment drew condemnation from the South End Brothers. You then uploaded a video of a still image of a male holding a knife with another Nasheed playing in Arabic. As a result, you were reported to the mosque committee at the Essex Jam Mosque, and they decided you were no longer welcome and that you would be asked to leave if you attended in the future. You were noted by one of those at the mosque to be talking and on occasion joking about jihad and war. It was noted that your WhatsApp status was changed to kill the non-Muslims wherever you see them. Members of the various mosques you attended <coughs> warned you about your behaviour. On the 25th of April 2022, you searched the internet for Usman Khan and Karim Butt, along with the London Bridge attack. Links to those involved in the terror attacks on London Bridge and Borough Market in 2017 and at Fishmongers Hall in 2019. In May 2022, on a number of occasions, you were seen dressed in an army jacket or bomber jacket. You were expressing views about how to deal with non-believers. Also that month, you recorded yourself reciting words in Arabic, referring to jihad, and there are images of you with captions on the difference between suicide and martyrdom and with a black flag. There is a video you recorded at Stratford Railway Station of a police officer in uniform who appears unaware of you. On that video, you can be heard to say the following. There is another one over there as well. Also in May, you were in conversation online with Miss A. Amongst messages passing between the two of you are comments about taking part in violent jihad in Syria. You write as follows. When I arrive to the land of martyrs, my goal is to die on the battlefield while trying to kill the Kufa. If you can encourage me to do that, then Abdullah, and I just want to die a martyr. Miss A responded supportively. There were further exchanges between the two of you, and you made the comment, let's race for it, inshallah. On the same day as these exchanges, you searched on the internet for Manchester bomber, terror attack, and Streatham attack. The following day, you searched for Salman Abedi on the internet. The same day, you recorded footage of yourself close to Stratford Magistrates Court with four uniformed officers by the court building. You later posted an image of the officers on Snapchat with the caption, Target Acquired. A few days later, you searched the internet for jihadi husband and wife. Various chat threads discussed arrested terrorist offenders and likely sentences. Also, on other days in May, there were ongoing chats between you and Miss A. There are references to seeing you in the news, waging war and training for jihad. Miss A is encouraging in her responses. In one message, you write, TBH, I just want to get my hands on an American Marine or a British Marine. Miss A also responds with encouragement to that and in graphic terms. You also sent her an audio message in which you include how you would get two Marines in a room and then them to rape each other. There are references to shooting them in the head and eventually beheading them. The chat between the two of you continues about violence and mutilating people. On the 17th of May, having attended the mosque, there is footage taken by you of being close to and by the gates of the barracks of the 7th Rifles Regiment. Your actions that evening appear to be reconnaissance. Late that evening, you make a Google search on your mobile for Jihadi Jack and Jihadi John. In the early hours of the next day, you carried out more internet searches for
for Salman Abedi and also on 7-11. The police forced entry to your home that morning, the 18th of May 2022, and you were detained and arrested. When arrested, you made a number of comments about your faith. Your phone, laptop and various items were seized, including a black flag, a leaflet on the dangers of ISIS, a notebook with notes both in English and Arabic on religious and philosophical views. You were taken to Basildon Police Station. Whilst there, you showed interest in the tactical vest worn by a police officer, asking if they were bulletproof. You made a number of other concerning statements. When re-arrested following a preliminary review of your telephone and its contents on the 19th of May 2022, you observed as follows, I don't believe in the UK law. The only law I believe in is the law of Allah. When interviewed, you gave a prepared statement saying that you had converted from Christi Christianity to Islam and that you developed an interest in Islam by watching YouTube videos. You admitted posting the status update video in April 2022 this was the uploading of the still image of a male holding a knife with an ashid playing in Arabic. You said the purpose was not to encourage anyone to destroy others. You refer to Kufa in Islam as a metaphor to destroy disbelievers. You wrote that the battle is not about the actual battlefield, but rather a battle against the soul not to sin. You also said that jihad can be translated to mean striving against the wrongful desires of the soul, against the devil, against hypocrites and disbelievers. The person holding the knife in the video is portrayed as a soldier. You challenged some of the assertions and the statements of the police officers in relation to comments it was claimed you'd made on arrest, but you then made no comment responses to all other questions. The police returned to your address on the 25th of May 2022 to conduct a further search. They then found the combat specs, ops glasses, a camouflage baseball cap and combat jacket, training shoes, a black rucksack containing a black balaclava, and a notebook with notes in Arabic on how to gain more Twitter followers and the tactical gloves. Whilst in police detention, an officer overheard part of a conversation you had with your mother when you spoke about needing to start training if you go to prison. You said this, I'm going to find someone in prison to train me. I need to start to eat more protein. I need to start training offensive and defensive. When I get out, I'm going to be offensive. I'm going to be a machine. I don't care. In my eyes, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not guilty, but I might plead guilty because I will get 30% off my sentence. Allah says he will punish the oppressors. Everywhere will be Sharia law one day. When I get out, they will be controlling me. They probably won't let me have a driving license because I'll probably run people over. During exercise in the yard a few days later, you made comments while engaging with officers saying you wanted to learn tactical training from an uncle at the mosque and also, if you know what you're doing with a knife, it doesn't matter if you're small. In relation to martyrdom, it was noted you said as follows, people should be martyred again and die for what they believe in <coughs> and that the tactical training you wish to take part in would have to be taken out of the country in a camp. Turning to the sentencing guidelines, the maximum sentence for a Section 5 offence is one of life imprisonment, or in your case, custody for life. For an offence committed on or after the 29th of June 2021, sentencing involves consideration of the application of the dangerousness provisions and a number of other statutory provisions introduced, including those in the Counter-Terrorism Sentencing Act 2021 and the Police Crime Sentencing of Corks Act 2022. The 2021 Act introduced serious terrorism sentences. An offence un offense under Section 5 of the Terrorism Act 2006 is a serious terrorism offence listed in Schedule 17A of the Sentencing Act 2020. This offence was committed after the 29th of June 2021 and you were over 18 at the time the offence was committed. The first question then is this. Is the court of the opinion that there is a significant risk to members of the public of serious harm occasioned by the commission by you of further serious terrorism offences or other specified offences? This is the same test with an important addition as for dangerousness. I also have in mind the provisions of 
Section 274 of the Sentencing Act 2020 on a required sentence of custody for life for an offence carrying a life sentence. I have helpful sentencing notes from both the prosecution and the defence. I also have a second note from the prosecution specifically on the issue of dangerousness and a response submitted on your behalf. I have a detailed pre-sentence report dated the 28th of March from an experienced probation officer. I am grateful to the author for their detailed analysis and assessment of the issues in this case. Since the last hearing of this case, I've also been provided with further documents. I have statements from Detective Constable Al Warath setting out relevant information about you and what appears to be your current attitude or mindset whilst you've been in custody. The officer has reviewed prison intelligence where you've made violent threats to kill, behead and chop up staff, have their loved ones follow home and beheaded, behead an imam and another prisoner. Some of those reports date back to last autumn. Some are more, more recent and post-date the preparation of the pre-sentence report. Initially on your behalf, it was submitted that the statement of the officer should be disregarded on the basis that it was unsubstantiated, equivocal and unproven bad character evidence. I made clear I did not agree with that assessment. It is material that is very significant in terms of the risk that have to be assessed. Whilst I accepted the weight to be attached to the contents has to be considered, it cannot be ignored. Following the last hearing on the 12th of May, DCR Warrath sent a further request to HMP at Wandsworth in relation to any intelligence relevant to you so it could be disclosed and considered. This further request also sought confirmation as to any adjudication and or disciplinary action taken against you. I note only one instance of formal adjudication with a verdict not to proceed. And in terms of disciplinary action, I note a number of negative disciplinary actions have been entered by prison staff spanning the period from June 2022 through to the 8th of May this year. The further statements set out other material relevant to the issue of dangerousness and to future risk. Attached to the statement is a schedule with all the intelligence material set out, and that schedule runs to some 69 pages. I repeat the observation I set out above, that this material needs to be viewed and considered in terms of future risks. Included within the pre-sentence report are observations about the interaction with PREVENT from November 2020 onwards and the lack of engagement. I also note the observations in the report about you saying you've changed your attitudes and beliefs and how this is at odds with the material from the prison, an extract of that material set out on page 7 of that report. The author of the pre-sentence report also sets out a list of risk factors in relation to the assessment on dangerousness. The assessment in the report of, of the level of danger is very high and allowing for all various features of the case, the author concludes the section of the report on assessment of the risk of serious harm with this observation. Having considered all the information above, the court may well determine that the criteria for dangerousness has been met. The prosecution submits that you are someone who intended to inflict serious violence on or endanger the lives of other people both in the UK and abroad. That intention was not merely transitory, but one you had settled on during a period of around six months as you set about preparing to commit those acts. They also submit that your time in custody following arrest and charge has not led to any reduction in the risk you pose to others. If anything, they submit that this court should be concerned that you are someone who does one thing when in the company of other prisoners, seeks out those who share your extremist views, but then say you have been doing the opposite when in conversation with professionals. Their submission is that this duplicity only serves to heighten the risk you pose to others. On your behalf, it is submitted that you are on the path to de-radicalisation. It is accepted that your progress may be imperfect and as yet incomplete, that you've taken significant steps forward. It is now accepted that the dangerousness test is met, but it is submitted that any risk you pose can be managed by the imposition of a sentence under Section 265 of the Sentencing Act or a sentence for an offender of particular concern. If that is not accepted by this Court, 
it is submitted that an extended sentence with a limited period of extension would suffice as you will be subject to onerous conditions on any licence. As I have set out, the sentencing hearing was adjourned part heard so as to allow more time for those who represent you to consider the prison intelligence material and so that they could address the possibility of a discretionary life sentence to meet the concerns of the risks going forward. I have a letter from your mother dated the 13th of April this year. She sets out her support for you and her assessment of your progress. She also makes clear that your father and your sisters will support you whilst in custody and on your release. She sets out her assessment that your views have changed in your period in custody through your engagement with an ideological mentor and since taking time to think and reflect. She also sets out the regret you have expressed to her for your actions. The supplementary note for sentence submitted on your behalf sets out extracts from a number of the decisions of the Court of Appeal on the approach to discretionary life sentences, as well as addressing issues around age and maturity. Future risk is the key issue in this case, and the real concern as to when, if at all, any risk may really reduce or cease. I have very much in mind your age and maturity, that people, young people mature at different stages but that has to be put into the mix alongside the observations of others and the views you appear to be expressing to some. Assessing risks is a very different task in terrorism cases to other types of cases involving violence. In my judgment, the threshold as set out in section 268B and for dangerousness is clearly passed. In my judgment, you are someone where there is a significant risk two members of the public of serious harm occasioned by the commission by you of further terrorism offences or other specified offences. Section 268B refers to the imposition of a sentence of custody for life and Section 268BF the risk of multiple deaths condition. Further provisions relevant to that condition are set out in subsection 3. Both the prosecution and the defence agree that under the current guideline, based on the levels of preparation here, your culpability would come within Category C. With harm, it is also agreed that the case falls within Category 3. I agree with the assessments of both the prosecution and your counsel as to the stage that your preparations have got to, and that it is safer to place harm into Category 3 than the higher Category 2. I note that it would have been easier for you, much easier for you to attack a police officer in the street than it would be for you to join ISIS in Syria. And so of the two terror acts you intend to carry out, the former more likely and the latter on the evidence as set out. For such a case, the start point for sentence would be one of eight years' custody with a range of sentence of between six and ten years' custody. The prosecution has identified a number of aggravating factors they submit that here the offending was motivated by hostility towards non-believers, you were in possession of extremist material, you were in contact with others who were also extremists, particularly Miss A, you used a number of aliases to conceal your true identity, you intended to commit acts of terrorism against soldiers and or police officers, and you failed to respond to warnings about your conduct, in particularly from your family and others in the mosques. Whilst some of those factors are accepted by Mr. Zahir, he makes observations as to the applicability of others. As a general point, I agree with Mr. Zahir that I need to make sure that to the extent these matters go into the initial categorization, I do not double count. In terms of mitigating factors, you are of previous good character, now age 19, 20 on the 3rd of October this year. At the time of the offending, you were 18. Looking at the impact of the aggravating and mitigating fact features I've identified, the start point would, in my judgment, be one of nine years' custody. It is important to stress that the guidelines also require the court to consider appropriate minimum terms, serious terrorism offences and exceptional circumstances, should they apply, as well as the impact of a finding of dangerousness as part of the sentencing procedure. Having reflected on all the facts of the offence, I do not find 
that the multiple deaths condition is met in this case, and so the passing of a serious terrorism sentence is not required. All are agreed that in those circumstances where the dangerousness test has been found to be met, the options open to this court are a discretionary life sentence, an extended sentence, or indeed a special sentence for an offender of particular concern. As I repeat, in relation to the option of a discretionary life sentence, I adjourn the sentence on the 12th of May so as to allow your counsel and solicitor to consider any other material they might be that might shed more light on your conduct and your mindset whilst in custody. They have had the opportunity to do so and today have made further extensive submissions on your behalf in relation to that issue. With regard to the type of sentences that have to be considered, I note what is set out at paragraph 22 of the judgment of the Len Lord Chief Justice in the case of the Crown against Marinskas in relation to discretionary life sentences. I need to consider the seriousness of the offence and any previous convictions. Well, here there are none. Perhaps most significantly in this case, I need to consider the level of danger to the public posed by you and whether there is a reliable estimate of the length of time you will remain a danger and the available alternative sentences. It is also important to note that since the decision in Berinskas, Parliament has passed further legislation with regard to terrorist offenders that I have set out. It is also important to note the particular and unique questions that can arise with the assessment of future risks of those involved in terrorism. In mitigation, Mr Zahir submits in relation to the offending itself that regard has to be had to the levels of preparation in this case that they were not far advanced and the risk of death was very remote. On the second limb and the potential commission of an act of terrorism here, he submits the steps or acts taken were limited in scope, of limited utility and the prospect of an act of terrorism again remote. In relation to the mindset material and the online relationship, again it is submitted that it shows a lack of maturity along with it a degree of bravado in a young man. He properly relies on the fact of your chronological age and the level of maturity and that you are someone who has a supportive family. In relation to the prison records, he submits that there are positive reports of changes. He submits that when you were detained you were an extremist. He invites caution as to the frustration on your part as not being seen to be any part of extremism. He submits that some of the reports show your candor and your willingness to openly discuss matters with prison staffs. He observes that you are now an enhanced prisoner. Three periods are set up by Mr Sahir that he submits show the prison records and the materials in a different light. In the course of this hearing, Mr Zahir took the court through those three periods. As I observed in the course of his submissions, it is helpful to have the full intelligence material in a case such as this, where future risk is the key issue. Mr Zahir submits on your behalf that the prison material supports the passing of an extended sentence rather than life sentence. He concedes, and properly so, that you are not someone who is free from extremism, nor that you are somebody who is not dangerous. But he submits the threshold for a discretion life sentence is not passed. In my judgment, the prison material presents a very mixed picture. There is some material that supports the stance adopted by Mr Zahir, and which is to your credit as to your openness and candor. However, there is other material that, that is pointing in the opposite direction and is of considerable concern. Would you stand, please? Having reflected on all the matters that have been set out and summarised in these remarks, and in particular on the level of danger to the public you pose, and whether there is any reliable estimate of the length of time you will remain a danger, I am of the view that there must in this case be a discretionary life sentence, and that is the sentence I impose upon you. There will be a sentence of custody for life. The risks around you, albeit as a young man, are clear and concerning. The way in which you say some things to professionals and yet say the contrary to others means that there is, in my judgment, no clear picture of when those risks may abate. That position supports my decision as to dangerousness leading to custody for life. 
you have pleaded guilty, your plea warrants a reduction in a sentence would otherwise have been passed. Having reflected on the submissions made this morning, the appropriate reduction in your case is, is one third. Having considered what would otherwise be the appropriate categorization of this case and the impact of the aggravating and mitigating features, including age and maturity, the appropriate sentence and minimum term, as I indicate, would be one of nine years custody, allowing for your plea a minimum term of six years. As there is now no early release for terrorist offenders, that minimum term is the same as what was used to be called the determinate term. The days on remand, which I'm told number 367 days, will count towards that sentence. And so the sentence of this court is one of custody for life with a minimum of six years, less 367 days. What that means is this, that before you will be first considered for parole, there will be a period of six years, less 367 days. If the information which I've been provided as the days on remand proves to be inaccurate, then the prosecution or defence must notify the court so that the case can be relisted to correct that calculation as soon as possible and in any event within 56 days. When it comes to the minimum term that you will serve, I make plain that I am not ordering that you are to be released at the end of it. Whether you will be released or not at that stage or at any later stage will be a matter for the parole board to consider. Only when the minimum term has been served can the parole board decide whether it is safe to release you or not. If the board does release you, you remain on licence and liable to recall for the rest of your life. If the statutory surcharge applies to your case, then the appropriate orders can be drawn up. I order the forfeiture under Section 23 of the Terrorism Act 2000 of four items, RJB1, a mobile phone, RJB2, a laptop, RJB23, tactical combat gloves, and RJB20, tactical combat goggles. You will be subject to notification requirements as set out in the Counterterrorism Act 2008. You may go down.